I, uh, I, I want to back up a little bit and uh, turn to Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent, which I think you obliquely sort of referred to earlier in the talk. Um, and the reason I want to bring this up following from kind of this discussion of alternative media is because I, uh, well, first of all, I want to get your thoughts on whether this model still holds up. And for anybody who's unfamiliar, I'm going to run through uh, Chomsky and Herman's propaganda model in a second. Um, but I think that maybe one of the advantages that non-mainstream media has is we're not necessarily subject to all of these specific filters. So I want to bring up this chart here. Um, this is a graphic from a Scottish illustrator named Sean Michael Wilson. Uh, check him out. I think he does a lot of like left illustrated books. Um, and this is from his graphic uh, graphic novel or like graphicization, I guess, of manufacturing consent. Um, so Chomsky and Herman in manufacturing consent kind of outline uh, five different filters that make up the propaganda model, which they say all information and news has to pass through before it can reach the viewer or the consumer, right? So the first one is concentrated ownership. Um, we all know about this. I, I think when Chomsky and Herman wrote the book, they were like shocked that 20 media conglomerates control basically all, uh, you know, mainstream broadcast outlets and like mass media publications. Now that number is six. So this has only gotten worse. Um, the second filter is advertising as the primary source of the uh, primary income source of the mass media. We all know this is a problem because of course, advertisers can choose to pull their funding and pull their ads if they don't like a uh, a channel or an outlet's content, or if they disagree with something that outlet had said. But I think that they also exert a more soft power in that, you know, if outlets and publications see that one type of content is more advertiser friendly or more profitable than another, they're going to be more incentivized to run that, right? Um, okay, the third filter, reliance on information provided by quote, expert and official sources. That's obviously, you know, uh, professional communications departments, whether that's in the state department, uh, the, the federal government, or, you know, corporations, uh, any institution these days, be it, you know, the White House or uh, a business or a nonprofit has a dedicated communications department to sort of provide the official narrative to the press. So this takes the form of like press conferences, press releases, photo ops. Basically, if you're the government or you're a corporation, you have an unlimited amount of resources that you can spend on crafting the narrative that you want to get in the media. Um, and of course, if you are the media, if you're a news outlet, you actually have a pretty limited set of resources to do investigative journalism. So that means that the press stuff, or, uh, you know, the, the quote, official narrative from the companies and the government is always going to dominate, right? Um, so closely related to that is the fourth filter, the idea of flack as a means of disciplining the media. So this is when, this is like another component of the PR apparatus, whereby when the media, you know, puts out an unflattering story or, you know, says something that a company or a politician doesn't like, they have an infrastructure in place to respond. And to just give one example, when I worked at the New Republic, um, every time I wrote a critical article about uh, Amazon or about, you know, this this or that politician, immediately I would get a badgering and or threatening email from their press department, from their communications department or from their legal department being like, well, you should really consider that like actually, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos has put X, Y, and Z uh, safety mechanisms into Amazon warehouses. And the point here is like, not that my articles were like so dangerous or something. They weren't like investigative journalism. Uh, like, honestly, like to be honest, like nobody was reading my articles at the New Republic. It's just that all of these places have entire departments whose entire job is to respond to, you know, is to monitor the Google alerts basically, right? And respond to any kind of negative press that they come across. Um, so that's the fourth filter. And then the last filter is an ideological one. And when Herman and Chomsky wrote the book, which was in 1988, this is obviously on the eve of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so they identified this ideological filter as anti-communism. And I believe in recent years, they have updated that to war on terror or they've you know they've said things like well you can replace anti-communism with war on terror or even just free market at this point right 
as sort of the like underlying ideological apparatus that shapes a lot of media narrative that we hear. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly run through the propaganda model because I think the interesting thing about manufacturing consent and specifically about this model in particular is these are all structural and economic forces. So Noam Chomsky and Herman, no, uh, Edward Herman, we're not saying that there's like a giant 1984 TV that just like blaring the same message at people. I think that they're also not saying that uh, Rupert Murdoch or like whoever runs the New York Times or these like evil puppet masters who are just like willfully disseminating lies in order to like turn a quick buck. Um, although obviously like those people exist. Um, and I think that they're actually very generous about individual journalists as well, um, perhaps more so than we would be, right? Like they, they are very clear that lots of journalists who go into the field um, actually as you you mentioned Matt, like think that they are doing good or like actually do actually are well intentioned or have noble intentions. But these are structural forces that shape the media um, and shape how we how we receive information. And I think for that reason, in my opinion, the model really holds up because those economic forces have only intensified since the 80s, in my opinion. And I guess my question to you is, uh, what do you find useful about this model? And and then if we go to the last filter, which if you if you recall was the anti-communism filter, like what do you think is the new update, especially in the sort of post-Trump, post-COVID era? Uh, I would say that it uh, is, that the, the model is most useful when talking about uh, the way to explain uh, the actual motives of journalists within it, like how, how to square the professed uh, and lived belief in journalistic ethics and, and objectivity that journalists genuinely embody uh, with the reality of, you know, their placement in this machinery. And it, and it is th that, uh, it is that self-selecting mechanism that happens without people even being aware of it. Uh, I would say that the biggest, uh, and, and then the question of what has replaced uh, anti-communism, I guess now it would be some sort of, I mean, if you're talking about like the media, uh, I, it's, that's, that's an interesting question because, uh, we're now at a point where the media has now like sort of fractured into this like dominant sort of democratic media, and then this, uh, this, the smaller, but, but equally influential among its base, uh, Republican media and they have different enemies and mm -hmm. but those the, but the enemy is the is the hero of the other one I guess it's just it's we've moved, we've turned inward right. after the after the failure of the Iraq war uh, we we turned inward and now the enemy is us and it's just a question of uh, which half mm -hmm. and so the, the the enemy now uh for uh the the mainstream is is that like recrudescent reactionary half the Trump half and then for the the uh, Republican the, sh the shard of that left and th 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 now it's largely turning into just the internet uh, <laughs> is just uh, it's the other half coercive mechanisms that that uh, c that define the actions of the mainstream journalists that means they're going to engage on the same superficial bullshit they're going to talk about the same culture war distractions they're going to frame everything on capital's terms because they're subject to the same incentives and so, I, I mean, I think a lot of people interpret the manufacturer consent thing kind of narrowly as just brainwashing. Um, and I think we're saying it's a little bit more nuanced to that. But do you think the left and people in general overstate the power of the media? I mean, I think our the best excuse we love on the left whenever a left candidate doesn't do well or yeah. something shows that a policy we like is unpopular, you know, it's the media, people are brainwashed, blah, 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 blah. Do you think we, we overstate the power of the media, especially on, you know, maybe regular working people, not like the hyperactivated Democratic Party base? Yeah, I think that the, the biggest thing that it needs to be updated about the uh, manufacturing consent model is just reducing its relevance to the grand scheme of consent manufacture, just because we've gotten to a point where the media is noise for most people. Mm -hmm. It is no longer this like fundamental organizing reality. If anything, for a larger and larger portion, it forms the uh, antithesis of the reality. Uh, and 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 the and the vast and the, the majority of people, uh, uh, especially the people who are feeling the the social dislocation most most profoundly, are alienated from it. They're not paying attention to it. They have disengaged from it because they have lived lives that have shown them every day that politics doesn't matter and that 
caring about it has to be some sort of affectation. And the thing is, it, it is an affectation, uh, but it used to be an affectation that felt was easier to feel like it was substantial because there was something that looked like uh, a, a a direct relationship between how you voted and your material conditions. That's gone. So yeah. why the hell would you vote unless it indulges something in your character, unless it's entertaining in some way? And you've got to have a certain life, a point of view. You have to have had a certain uh, acculturation to find that engaging. And that well, fewer and fewer people it's true of, which means the media is just becoming it's being tuned out and all it provides is just the fabric for people to form their own reality out of, which is what people are doing with QAnon. And uh, what I think as like people get repoliticized as things get worse, who have been alienated when they come back into engagement with uh, the media, it's not going to be on the media's terms and their reality. It's going to be by defining themselves against it and then using the broken pottery of the, the media world that they've encountered in their lives, fashioning some sort of uh, antithesis to it that's going to mostly be uh, some conspiracy bullshit because there is no uh, 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 there is no experience of, of organizing along class to complement one's understanding of the world beyond the media that they consume. So on that point, I, I have to bring up uh, this amazing graph from the Gallup poll uh, survey that I mentioned earlier. So this looks at the um, basically uh, Americans' trust in the media, which I said overall is, is very low. But when you split it up by political party, in 2020, you see a really like interesting and crazy thing, I think, where the blue line is Democrats, obviously, 73% of Democrats who were polled said that they trust the media. Only 10% of Republicans, which is the red line below there, said that they trust the media. And then the gray line in the middle, 36% is independents. Um, and, and I think that's really wild. And actually when I was looking at it, Matt, I thought about uh, a distinction you've made, I think a couple times of the, of the difference between the party of don't be a pussy and the party of don't be an asshole. So if you, I mean, I think that probably a lot of viewers are like familiar with that distinction, but maybe lay that out again and like tell us what you make of that that media chart. Well, when when the the uh, class engine got taken out of politics in the seventies yeah. and was replaced by a purely uh, effective politics that is detached from uh, meaningful conditions, that meant that people wherever they found themselves in the social strata were going to uh, find themselves. Uh, more and more compelled to uh, assert their identity through their politics. And that means that if you are somebody who uh, is part of the media, who had a certain experience of life and was acculturated to certain values, your commitment to the social liberal agenda, broadly spoken, is going to become more and more central to yourself and to the stuff that you put out, which means that since that's the only real terrain of battle, the thing that defines the Democrats and Republicans, the Republican half of the of the uh, viewership is going to over time notice that uh, and become more and more alienated from the center of uh, what's supposed to be the mainstream agreed upon reality. They're going to define it par as along partisan lines in a way that they didn't used to, uh, and that only gets more uh, extended over time. And that means that there is a pressure on the other side among liberals to grab more and more onto the Democrat or onto the media and to invest more and more idea of the media as like part of their side, basically, which means that all the effort put into making the media say the right things and to be inclusive is literally designed only to backfire and increase reaction to it because you're not persuading anybody at this point. You're mm -hmm. not offering a neutral arbitration of issues. You're only offering grist for a mill that is a sterile cultural conflict between the two parties that defines politics by either entrancing people or alienating them, but not by ar arranging them along class lines in any way. All right. Well, Matt, uh, it's been great having you on. This is the last question for you, I promise. We're going to let you go after this. But speaking of the media, do you have any alternative media sources, podcasts, whatever, to recommend people? Uh, I mostly just scroll my Twitter feed. I gotta say, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to, uh, I mean, I, I, obviously I, I got the Jacobin 
you know, you, you, I click on you guys. Oh, look at that. Get some articles going. Uh, but, <laughs> All right. Well, you heard it here first from Matt Christmas. Right. Subscribe to All Jack media here. bad except Jack and <laughs> Jack wow. good. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> everybody on my yeah everybody all all the all the all the buddies get together do some good media good all work. right thank you matt that was great all right bye bye see you soon all right see you matt